infinite. I would appreciate it if you would all grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. This is a very stirring chapter in the Bible. It certainly fits in, I believe, with the information we have learned and gathered about the Puritans. Uh, there, it was brought up uh, at dinner discussion tonight that there are many, many uh, sections of history that we could point to. For instance, during the Revolutionary War, anybody ever t been to Valley Forge and attended that area and seen the unbelievable conditions that uh, George Washington and his men had to live in and exist in? and that painful winter that they went through, uh, there was tremendous suffering. Uh, the stories about them wrapping their feet in claws, not even having shoes, the, amount, the tremendous amount of dedication and faith those men had to have to fight that Revolutionary War may sound even strange revolution, using the term revolutionary because there have been a lot of ungodly revolutionary wars that have occurred. We're all familiar with what happened in France and the French Revolution, which was really a communist rev revolution. But what happened in the United States of America was quite different. And when you stop and you think about what it took for those men to endure it was much the same type of faith that the pure, our Puritan pilgrim forefathers had. And we need to cherish that. We need to value that. And may I suggest we need to do our best to try to understand the covenant relationship that they had with Almighty God. Perhaps this will help us as we read these verses tonight here in Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 23. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Stop and think about it. What did it say again? They were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now, that suggests to me, and I'm not trying to pr promote a spirit of rebellion or anything, but you can't read that particular verse there and not also understand that it was an act of rebellion that they were committing. There, again, we have to change our thinking in a lot of areas. Exactly what areas those will be, we don't have time to discuss those tonight, but that... I mean, we've talked about it before. We've presented messages on it before. And I'm sure a lot of you understand what happened, or what the Bible explains in uh, the book of uh, Revelation chapter 18 about coming out of Babylon. It, it, it describes the ungodly governmental authorities that exist within Babylon. And the good news it presents is that we are going to come out of Babylon. When and how, you know, that's for a later discussion. But when I was reading this over again, it certainly was refreshed in my memory when it says they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Is there a time that we should not be afraid of the king's commandment? I like the example that's been used before of communists coming in or maybe during World War II or uh, that era and the Nazis coming in and uh, they're looking for your wife. What are you going to say? Oh, she's upstairs hiding under the bed. Is that what you're going to say? Or are you going to, dare I say, lie to the authorities? Well, isn't that a kind of, in a sense, what happened here with Moses? What about Rahab the harlot? They call her a harlot. I, that's another discussion in and of itself. But Rahab, what did she do? 
she lied to those soldiers to protect Israelites. So again, all I'm, all I'm suggesting here, ladies and gentlemen, is, oh, wow, we could just, we're free to go out and lie. No, but unashamedly, to protect my brethren, to protect you, to protect my family, if it comes down to it, I do not owe Babylon the truth if I feel that they're coming to threaten my children or my family or any of you. Okay, let's continue. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That took revelation, light, truth, and understanding for him to, to say that. And he realized there's something evil about this Egyptian system. They're oppressing my people. And I no longer want to be associated with them. I'm coming out of that system. What did the Puritans do? They realized that the king was ungodly. Now I know that I think for us to just stop right there and believe that he was totally evil is not right either. But that would really take away a lot of time. But all I'm saying here is they, there, was, there was persecution of the church. And they loved the church. And they realized that I don't care what authority they claim to be, the king, the queen, his servants, the sheriff, if they're going to come against God's people, we have a biblical mandate, we have a biblical authority to stand against that ungodliness. If you can't see that it, with what happened in the revolution even, George Washington and his men, what did Patrick Henry say? Give me liberty or give me death. What type of spiritual faith did it take for that man to say that? I forgot who, it's, who said it right now, but uh, said, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. I don't think he was kidding. Nathan what? Nathan Hale. I don't think he was kidding at all. I think he really meant it. In other words, what he's saying, if they killed him and God Almighty resur <laughs> resurrected him, he would want to get right back in the thick of battle for the cause of liberty and freedom and having a righteous vision for this nation. They didn't do so just to establish a nation so another evil monarchy or a democracy or some other form of government could be established. They did so with a biblical vision, with a biblical hope, and they, they, they surrounded themselves with the Christian community. My heart stirs with me when I go back east and I look at those uh, Christian communities that are still there. They had a tight-knit knit group of people, and they band together. Man, there's so much that I could say on this, but, you know, I do not hate the other races. And I realize that even within our own people, there can be problem people, but we should be able to deal with them and weed them out and correct, bring correction to whatever problems of people within our own race that may be there causing problems. I'm well aware that there, white people can be criminals. I'm, a, I'm well aware that white people can do evil things. But I'm also aware that there is a biblical standard. There are biblical principles of kind after kind. I want to be with my own kind. That does not mean I have the biblical right or authority to go and be mean and cruel and treat people of other races ungodly in an ungodly way. I think I have the biblical responsibility when even the Mexicans come over here or whoever that we treat them in a godly, fair, righteous, law-abiding way as much as possible. I am not, I have no biblical mandate to to respect their religion, or even welcome their paganism, them bringing their other gods into this nation. So when, it depends on the issues. 
But on issues like that, you will see this minister take a strong, hard line against opening the floodgates of them to come into our nation. Because that's the problem. We have an alien, antichrist government that has opened the floodgate to allow aliens into our country. And I'm not just talking about from Mexico. I'm talking about from Vietnam. I'm talking about from the Philippines. I'm talking about from China. I'm talking about even from Canada. I met some people I don't like in Canada. I also met a lot of people that I like up there. I understand that, you know, when I've been in Canada many times. I feel pretty comfortable there. I feel like I'm mainly among my own. But I also know that Canada has an alien problem too. And I also am aware that they have a socialistic government. And I'm also aware that we have a communist government. If you don't understand that, you need to get my first message because I kind of went into that the last time. All ten planks, again, of the Communist Manifesto are, are being practiced by our government. I thought it was very interesting in our conversation the other night with a few people, and we all came to the agreement. Actually, we think that the United States of America has become more communist than Russia today. I think that Putin, their leader over there, is less of a communist than Obama. If you don't agree with me, get your own doctrine like J.B. says. That's the way I see it. All right. Verse uh, 25, choosing rather to suffer the afflictions with the people of God. Now, does that, isn't that what I was just telling you? That's kind after kind. I want to be with the people of God. Oh, well, that, that means all Christians. No, it doesn't mean that in what he's saying right here. This is talking about the people of Israel. I want to be with the people of Israel. I want Israel to get their act together with God Almighty. And that has to happen before we're going to deal with all the world, world's problems out there. It's the world that wants to bring everybody together and blend and mix us and blend and mix us till we don't even know who we are today. With all the love, I want to assure you that our Christian forefathers did not have that type of understanding. They got off track a number of times. Did they mistreat the Indians? Sure they mistreated the Indians, but I can assure you the Indians mistreated them too. I mean, I mean it's always the noble red man, never the noble white man. When you look at the when, if you could actually compare who killed more Indians, I would venture to say from a lot of research that I've done, the Indians actually killed more of their own than the white man did. What would the world think today if they could see how the Indians treated their elderly? When they reached a certain age, a lot of them just kicked them out of the camp right there. Go off and die. We ain't got room for you. Too much of a burden. Oh, that was real noble. We, want, we could go over lots of those issues. But I choose rather to suffer affliction with God's people. I want to be with God's people. Well, I'll add a little bit more to that. That would also mean I don't want to be with a bunch of pagan white people. If you're going to be anti-Christ in any way, shape, or form, I don't want you a part of our group. I'm always willing to have that door open, but you're going to have to come in and prove you love Jesus. You're going to have to come in and do some real biblical repentance and show that you want to be a part of that group. It's just like in Corinthians. Remember how they kicked that individual out that was committing those sins in the book of Corinthians? And then later they let him back in because it says, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I know some of you believe in a literal Satan. I don't believe in the Judeo-Christian Satan. If you want to believe in that, that's fine with you. If you want to sit here and condemn me for what I believe and not study the issue out and not learn what Pastor Barley has, has studied and researched on it and get his tapes, 
and shame on you. But if you want them, I have a series of tapes called Satan and His Kingdom. You're looking at me kind of funny, Joanne. Uh, have you heard those tapes? Did I send you a copy of those tapes? Okay, well, I'll have to brainwash you and send, them, send you a set of those. Because I know you will listen. You're a truth seeker. Even if you don't agree with me, I, I value truth seekers. And I value, by the way, anybody show me where I'm wrong. But I, 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 I just stipulate this. Listen to every one of them. I think there's eight of them. Listen to every one of them. Start at number one. Don't jump at the end. It's, oh, I think I know where he's going. But you're going to have to prove to me that I'm wrong. Now, years ago, I didn't have this knowledge and understanding, and, and I had some discussions with people, and they could just walk right over me because I didn't have enough knowledge. It's like when uh, uh, there, Jesus is um, uh, talking to the devil. How many, how many of you are familiar with that? On that mountain. And I, I remember hearing Pastor Remy talk on that years ago, and that was one of my questions. He says, how can you overcome that one? I mean, he's talking to the devil, you know? Well, believe me, there's a good biblical answer for that one. The Bible says that he experienced things just like we do. <clears throat> That's a key to understanding what happened there in that conversation. But anyway, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Now, I want you to think about this. We're reading in verse 26 here. What Moses did was for Christ and his kingdom. How many of you have read these verses and not really paid attention to what I just read there? Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ. Am I misreading the scriptures here? Isn't that what your, does your Bible say that? Yes, Gee, I wonder if Jesus is God. Well, I'm fanatical enough to believe it. Are you? You're not really going to grow spiritually until you know who God Almighty is. Is that okay with you? I mean, how can you? If you're confused about who he is, you know, it's like I've told people. Well, how do you pray? Well, I pray to uh, Jesus the Son, and I pray to God the Father, and I pray to the Holy Ghost. I said, well, then you better pray. you got three gods there. Do you pray to all three of them? Or do you have a revelation that when I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ. And I blame JV. He, he, he brainwashed me with that information a long time ago, so don't get mad at me. Get mad at him. Amen. Amen. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Do treasures have a control of our heart? Or is it the devil? Some of you don't like me talking about the devil right now. Well, it, when it's your sermon, you can preach about the devil all you want. I won't kick you off the podium. But I want to tell you right now, there's more problems within my carnal mind and within my carnal heart and my my carnal mind being an enmity with God than I ever have had with some devil. So, treasures. In other words, there's enticing things that are presented to us out there by this worldly system. There are things that, of this world that are there to corrupt us. What we have to understand is, and we have to question, where's our allegiance? If someone presented a million dollars to some Christians today and said, I want you to do such and such, I want you to violate the scriptures, 
Use your imagination in whatever way that you want to on that one. In fact, there's a movie that was done a number of years ago. I think the name of it was Indecent Proposal or something like that. And it's a worldly thing, obviously, but it's of a, a guy being married to a girl, and I think it had Robert Redford, who was a multimillionaire, and he wanted to test this guy, and he, so I'll give you a million dollars for your wife, and she'll go to bed with me. Yeah, you remember that. Okay. So that's a weird example, but maybe it's something we need to consider. I really wonder what Christians would do if worldly treasures were presented to them. Is our faith that weak, or do we have a strong enough faith to say, no way, Jose, not going to do it, not going to be involved in that? Now, you may think, well, this is kind of a downer. Actually, it's not. Because what I'm saying to you folks, and I know most of you, I believe with my whole heart and soul that would even be a problem. I think we are so, most of us are so sick of this world and the worldly flavor and the things of this world. We want the kingdom. Because we realize no matter any way that we give into this world out here, the world is going to just corrupt it. The world is just going to twist it. The world is going to continue to spit in Christ's eye and, and do their best to oppress the kingdom of God. I don't want any part of that. I mean, people vote for Obama. People vote for the promises of government. Oh, if you'll just vote for us, we'll straighten this economic problem out. We'll do this for you. We'll, make, we'll put a miracle on the right track again. And what happens? Huh? They, they twist it, and they pervert it, and they continue with their ungodliness. I don't want to be a part of that. I'm tired of it. All right, for he had respect into the recompense of the, of the reward. In other words, what I think we're reading here is, ladies and gentlemen, is Moses had a covenant understanding. Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Here we're coming up with that again, not fearing the wrath of the king. In other words, what it's saying is he rebelled against Pharaoh. And he did not fear the wrath of the king. He was literally willing to die for his beliefs, for his faith in Christ. And that's what these verses tell us. He had a faith in Christ. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured. He saw the power of the Holy Spirit. The invisible God was there. He couldn't see him, but he could feel God's presence. Right? And he was moved by the presence of God to do the righteous thing. Man, that's great. That's what we need to do. That's the type of people we need to be. Should we not try to be what we're reading here in these verses? I don't think these things are written in Scripture because we can't obtain them, but that we can obtain these things. Does that make sense to you? In other words, again, what we're talking about is having a spiritual transformation in our view and our understanding. I really believe that there has been something wrong in Christianity. The type of Christianity that we has been taught and promoted in most churches out there has been a milk toast, watered down form of Christianity. Well, does that mean that you know we have to we have to get hardened up and and uh, we can't have love? I didn't say that at all. I we can have love. How can you have love 
and go against God's will, though? How can you have love, and people really feel love, if we water down the gospel and we don't obey the gospel? If, if we as a Christian people, let's put it this way, take a step away from the gospel because, oh, it's not going to hurt anything. Won't carnal minds reason this way? Have they not reasoned this way? Well, you know, there's an emotional issue over here. There are these orphans that uh, their, their house burnt down. The, 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 the home for these orphans. Oh, my God, this is... Doesn't your heart just pour out for them? So, federal government, we want to come to you and we want you to tax the public to build them a new home. Oh, what a loving, what a loving appeal. That sounds so Christian. Yes, government do that. So we take that step. And then something else comes along. Until we eventually get to... Well, look at all the starving people in Africa. We've got to do something about that. They don't have water. They don't have these resources, you know. So federal government, we want you to send their government. We want you to send that region of the world over there $50 million, $100 million, a $1 billion. Oh, that would be so wonderful, wouldn't it? That would be the Christian thing to do. And what have they done? They have used the treasures of this world to lead us away and, to, and distort our Christian vision and understanding. When we, every time you see these kinds of corruptions happen out there, in, in infringements of our rights, freedoms, and liberties, you can every time look at it where they're violating Scripture. I guarantee you, look where they're violating Scripture. In other words, we're going to have to have a biblical sense of, of economics. You follow me? We're going to have to have a biblical sense of justice and righteousness. And we're going to, that a lot of what the world, they're real good at appealing to us emotionally. But they're leading us astray from the kingdom of God and the cause of righteousness. I believe, and you know this as well as I do, that if we're really following kingdom principles... We're going to be far, helping the poor and the needy far more than all the socialistic, communistic handouts that our government's going to be supporting and stealing from our wallets. When you understand what's happening today, too, really what is happening is they are extracting wealth. They're extracting our sustenance so that we are not going to be able to pursue and support kingdom principles and kingdom causes. The Puritans and pilgrims didn't look to the wealth that was in Europe. That's where the wealth was. They did not rely on the wealth, on the treasures of Pharaoh, King James. They applied the word of God because they realized our treasures, our treasure is the word of God. You had, they had a, a powerful, dynamic faith. I was telling Brother J.V. earlier. I've read recently some of the early day writings of the fathers of the Puritan movement and the pilgrims. It blew me away. It, I just had to kind of walk away from it for a little bit because it was so biblically overpowering to me, I could hardly comprehend it. I didn't quite know how to deal with it. What I'm telling you is, I realize these people had something way more profound in their view and understanding, a biblical view of Christianity, than what we have today. That if we could have this strong biblical foundation, this strong biblical education today, 
Man, I tell you, we would be able to put the enemy to flight. We would be able to stand our ground against Pharaoh's army. We would be, we would, we would be able to stand on principles with clear vision and understanding that Pharaoh and all the threats of the enemy out there, even with death threats, would not be able to lead us astray and would not be able to dampen that faith. What did our forefathers believe? They believed that the, this, that system, and listen, it was far more godly than what we've got today as a system, were full of serpents. And so they believed that our duty, our, God, our God-given responsibility and duty is to tread on serpents. Is it ringing a bell here? I'm getting a little bit dangerous here because I almost wish that I could just keep preaching till midnight here because I've got that much for you. This is amazing stuff, folks. Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he, he that destroyed the firstborn should, be, should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians assuaged to do were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Boy, can you imagine living at that and seeing that? By faith the harlot Rahab perished, not with them that, be that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. We talked about that earlier. And what shall I say more? For time would fail me to tell of, of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. I don't know about you, your, is your heart stirred? In reading these verses? I hope so. Quench the, the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the enemies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Wow. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. How do you like that for Christianity, folks? Anybody want to taste that type of Christianity? They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and dens and caves of the earth. All these having obtained a good report through faith, not and received not the promise. What? Going through all that work, all, going through all that torture, all that tribulation, and didn't receive the promise? Think about Moses. He didn't get to go into the promised land. That's not fair. In the world, it's not fair, is it? I mean, that man had to endure all these complaining Israelites for years and years. My God, he spent 40 years Growing up in Pharaoh's palace, 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years with those rebelling Israelites. Going up there on the mountain, visiting with God, communing with God, his spirit's uplifted, comes down, and what are these rascals doing? They're making golden calves and worshiping idols. That'll give you a 
confidence in God's people. Listen, friends. What we're reading here is true Christianity. We need to get a vision of true Christianity. I know there's lots of different sermons I could preach on, but I'm preaching on this one right now. And I think we need to get a vision, again, of what true Christianity is. Most of what passes for Christianity today is New Age humanistic concepts passed off in the name of Christianity. What does the Scriptures tell us? Warns us of those that call Him Lord, Lord, but they are more interested in pleasing the world. They're more interested in worldly treasures. They're more interested in following John Hagee in blessing the Jews. Is that what we are called to do? Well, do people actually believe that that is solid Christianity? That that is a biblical mandate that we have to support the Jews? Now, is it hate for me to look at God's Word, read what God's Word says about the Antichrist, read those verses which say, don't even bid on God's speed. And then I turn around and say, no, I listen to Hagee. He makes a lot of sense to me. It sounds very Christian to me. I'm going to send $1,000 to help him support the Jews so we can make these trips to Israel over there. And so, you know, the blessings will flow. We want to keep those blessings flowing into America. What blessings, may I ask, are you asking to flow into America? When I look at what's happening in all the ungodliness in our nation today, God help us. We need to change our... The, if this is Christianity, I don't want any part of it. If selling our soul to the international bankers is our idea of becoming a blessed nation, coming out of our economic bondage, becoming a very productive nation, we need our heads examined. What are we doing? We're borrowing money from those that are oppressing us today. We're borrowing money from those devils that are behind all these regulations and, and corruption. It's being financed by these money changers. Oh, it makes so much sense to me that we can go borrow money and to come out of debt, go borrow more debt, and then when we run out of money and we're, we're hurting economically, the, what we're told to do is go borrow more debt. Oh, what are we? $16 trillion in debt, they're telling us. And quite frankly, friends, I don't believe that. I believe it was way more than that when you add up all the different types of debts out there. I believe we are well over 100, close to 100 trillion in debt. You have no idea of all these different nego secret negotiations. What do they call that? I want to call them um, der derivatives. Yes, when you under look at what's happening there with this ungodly system and the derivatives there, and what's going on in the stock market, all it is, quite simply, you've heard it before, is a Ponzi scheme on a larger scale. That's all it is. What is it going to take, though? All it takes is people with a biblical understanding. It's going to happen. How it's going to happen we don't have time to get into, but I want to assure you, look at what happened again with Iceland. What happened with, with Iceland? They declared a jubilee. Are we being, um, as a matter of fact, 
I hear very little in the news about that. And you know why they don't want to talk about that? Because the light might go off in Greece and Spain and other nations, hopefully in America, and they'll start to thinking about this and realize, yeah, why don't we declare a jubilee? Now, one of the problems with it might be this, that if you just declare a jubilee and you cancel the debt without having an, a biblical understanding of the reasons why, you're just going to get right back into it again. So what has to happen? We have to cancel the debt, and we have to drive the money changers out of the temple. Amen. Now, you want to talk about devils? We're getting real close to it right there. I'm more oppressed by those types of devils than I am any other type of devil. But, here's a question for you now that I'm on it. Was it Christian what Jesus did? Think about what he did. He went and made a whip, and he physically went after those devils and drove them out of the temple. He got, wow, physical with them. Oh, bad Jesus, that wasn't love. You know, he should have, he should have, you know, just gone in, you know, and showed him some love and understanding. Well, I think he showed him exactly what they deserved. Or he isn't Jesus. Now, if I would have gone in there and done that, we would find all kinds of problems with it. Well, he was acting out of the flesh. You can't say that about Jesus. You know? He went in there. You know, you start to think about it. He went in there, and they had tables. And what does it say he also did? He flipped those tables over on them. He got mad. And don't even get me started into the different types of name calling that he used on them. Why did sepulchers, etc.? Well, you, you, you're encouraging us to go cussing. That's not what I'm encouraging you to do at all. But perhaps what I am doing is saying, because we don't hear this today, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm misreading Scripture. Maybe I'm just totally wrong. Please show me if I am wrong. Why can't we have righteous indignation again? What, ha what happened to it? You mean to tell me Christians can't get mad, upset, or angry? I don't want a Christian fighting any dead gum revolution that can't get mad and angry at the enemy. I don't want to be in the war, in the thick of a war, who, with a Christian that doesn't want to fight. Jesus said we're supposed to be more than conquerors through him, did he not? Well, what are you telling me to do, grab my gun? No, I didn't say that. But I am saying that we need to be men and stand up. Isn't that what, isn't that what um, what's his name, Moses' leader, I slipped my mind right now, Joshua. Isn't that what, he's telling them to be men. Rise up like men, stand up like men, act like men. There's too much estrogen going around today. I was talking to uh, uh, Brother Doug uh, earlier, I think it was today. And he was telling me about the effeminizing effect that all this estrogen has. I, I am amazed. I shudder. I shake my head. I feel like uh, Nehemiah when he's dealing with his people. Remember? They were in there whoring after these other races. And he was begging them, don't do it. He was plucking his hair out. It says he got mad and he smote them. Bad Nehemiah. Do, 
we're, we're going to have to have a change of thinking. Because I wonder if God Almighty calls us to stand up like men and to be men, are we even close to being prepared? In other words, think about how many times have you heard, God bless old Jerry Falwell, first of all, to some degree. But I don't, I heard him, I've heard congressmen, they'll get in there and they'll make a good statement. Standing up, they'll, they'll stand up on some righteous principle. The media will come after him, attack them, and they'll say, oh, I, 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 I'm sorry. I didn't really mean that. And I'm like, wait a minute, you just said a vital truth. Our people need to hear that. They need to see that type of leadership where you'll stand up and declare the truth. And they oh, I'm sorry. I mean, if you really are wrong and you're, and you're, you're against God's word, okay, by all means, apologize. I'm all for you doing that. We, that's being a man too. But by golly, Men are vanishing today for some reason. Well, I'd like to tell you some examples of me going into some of these shops from time to time, like a Starbucks or something like that, and see these guys with earrings on, you know, and I'm just like, you got to be kidding me, buddy. And you want to wait on me, and you want me to send my good money to you when you're flaunting your faggotness in my face and in this community. There was a time when men of God would have grabbed that little rascal by his neck, drug him out of town, maybe tarred and feathered him or something like that. I've had people tell me, you know, the Klan, they were really bad people and I wouldn't want to be a part of the Klan. Well, I'm certainly not standing up for all that the Klan means, but I know Klan members. I know Klan people. I know there's some good, godly people involved in that organization. And I can guarantee you, some years back, if a man would have come home drunk and beaten his wife, those Klan would have been called. They would have grabbed that man out, taken him out, and beat him. And I want to assure you, they stopped a lot of this unrighteous, ungodly behavior that was going on. Oh no, we want to wait on the government to do it all for us today. Yeah, that's working out real good. How about Colorado? I mean, really, we wouldn't be having, the, we wouldn't be having Colorado if we we're applying God's law. And what do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean, you take these people these, that are doing these crimes out and you publicly execute them. You go back and you read in God's law. They didn't hide it. They didn't put them in jail for 50 years or whatever while they appeal and appeal and appeal at taxpayers' expense. They tried them. They gave them a fair trial. And they publicly hung them or stoned them to death. What did this guy do this, that did all this shooting? Okay, I'm not going to get into the fact that he might have been brainwashed and all that. Forget all that right now. But I guarantee you, if they took him out and shot, he used a gun, use a firing squad. Let the public hear him cry for his life, beg for his life. Crazy or not. Crazy or not. He had doggone right. Doggone right. Oh, five minutes. <laughs> hey, I want to read this to you. We're talking about covenant. John Winthrop. He came over here right after the Puritan and Pilgrims came. About, what was it, 1630? He came over on a ship called the Arabella. And, and here's what he wrote. He was a man that understood covenant and believed in covenant. This is one of those guys, you go back and you read his, what, his writings, 
and his biblical wisdom, it is so profound and it's so deep. That if we can become a people like that again, I'm not putting on a fleshy level here, but if we can become a people like that again, you're going to start seeing some change because people will understand the need to change and why to change. You can't change if you don't know why, if you don't have the biblical revelation, biblical understanding, and you're not equipped biblically to do that. Well, so what I'm telling you is we've got a great work ahead of us. We can sit back and say, you know, the, the enemy's got it all wrapped up. There's nothing we can do. Well, I don't want to be a part of that kind of Christianity. I really don't. Then I might as well sit down and shut up and forget what I'm preaching anything. Forget it. But if there's something we more we can do, that's the kind of preacher I want to hear from. That's the kind of truth I want to hear. I want to hear the truth that will change things. I, want to, I believe that the truth will set us free. I believe that the truth can change America and put America on the right track again. I don't know how many it's going to take, but I don't think it would even take 3%. I think the enemy is so scared of the sons of God that the sons of God got busy and dedicated themselves to that purpose and that resolve and they covenanted together. It's over. We've won. All right. Here's what he said, though. The Lord will be our God and delight to dwell among us as His own people. He will command a blessing on us in all our ways, so that we shall see much more of His wisdom, power, goodness, and truth than we have formerly known. We shall find, are you listening? That the God of Israel is among us. And ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemy. Think about what he's saying here. He's talking about resisting the enemy. I think we need some more talking about resisting the enemy. The Lord will make our name a praise and glory. Man. So that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England, meaning the Puritan model and pattern. For we must consider that we shall be like a city on a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us. People are watching us. People are saying, what are you going to do? Do you have a plan? That's a question for us. But think about those words. Do you hear those kind of words today from the pulpit or any ministers? Very few. God's raising up. Men of God, people of God, with a biblical vision. You've got to understand what that kingdom is all about. <clears throat> the Bible says that when two or three are gathered in His name, there He is also. And what little time we have here tonight, I want you to think about covenant, because I believe that we can covenant and that we can make a difference. When God Almighty made a covenant with Abraham, He gave His word to Abraham. He did not require Abraham to give His word. When God Almighty came together with the children of Israel under Moses, there was a little bit of a different covenant made there. It was a marriage covenant. They agreed to the terms of the covenant. They said, all that thou hast said we will do. God Almighty says, fine, let's make a covenant. God kept His word. Israel did not keep their word. There were other covenants, a Davidic covenant. We could look at all those other things. But of course, later comes the new covenant, right? Was that a marriage covenant? No. Jesus said, I'm going to make this covenant with the house of Judah and with the house of Israel. It was basically the same covenant that was get delivered unto Abraham. God doesn't have a plan B. 
It's always been plan A. But he's going to fulfill it. He's going to bring it about. But here's the question. What's to stop us from giving our word? What's to stop us from doing what our Puritan pilgrim forefathers did and making a covenant? Isn't that what they did? They made a covenant, a compact, a Mayflower compact. What would be to stop us? Well, we have that opportunity in having communion in part. If we understood, and I don't have time to get into it right now, but if we understood communion and the principles of communion, those are the very principles of covenant. So when we are partaking of communion, it is a sacred, a sacred rite and ritual. It is a holy covenant that we are coming to agree upon. It's not that we just sit here and act through the ritual in a dead way, but in a, with a greater understanding that God Almighty wants to write His laws upon our heart. Shouldn't that have a more profound effect upon He wants to write what? He wants to write His laws on our heart? Well, that means that I need to love Him and appreciate Him and spend some time studying what His laws are. And that I become an extension of His light because the Word of God, as the speakers brought out earlier today, is a light. That I be extension of that light for the kingdom of God. To help bring restoration and deliverance to our people, to our nation, for Israel. Yeah, I'm saying let's do this for Israel. Because if we don't, if we ignore plan A and we go and we say, no, I, 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 see, I, see a, a, um, I see more of a multicultural spiritual vision here. Well, you, you go that away and you let me know how it works. But I will take just a handful of people that understand what I'm saying here. And we'll go off and we'll covenant and we'll follow the true covenant vision. And you go off and do your multicultural thing and we'll compare our notes in 10 years. You're going to find a big difference. So, I want the, uh, them to come forward now and we're going to pass the communion plates. We're going to do a little bit more thinking about this. So Jerry and um, I don't know who else was going to be helping you here. Dennis, if y'all would go. Okay. So while they're doing that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and continue to brainwash. Again, when two or three are gathered in his name, there he is also. Jesus said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Here's a question. Do you believe this? So, he's still with us today. Amen? Amen. Are we with him? In other words, are we in covenant with him? To me, if you just say, well, I'm with him. Oh, yeah, I'm with you, Jesus. But there is no covenant. I don't think you're really with him. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6 says, Be strong and of good courage. Fear not. Be not afraid of them, your enemies. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 we read, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he's, he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We're told this over and over. 
I don't think he's violated. I don't think he's changed one little bit. I think we have changed. You know, even when persecution is so bad that we could just scream, we need to stand with Jesus. We need to stand on righteous principles. We need to be there. We need to be there for our people. We need to be there for our nation. We need to understand that we have a high calling. I'm not asking for miracles. I'm not telling you really anything. But I think right now we do need to have this type of information or input. It's not up to me to change your heart. It's like salvation. I can't save any of you. you I think you're already saved, right? But, and of course, if it comes only from me, it's not going to do really any good. It'll wash off. But it is my prayer that God Almighty will use what I have told you tonight and add to it and build faith within your heart. Give you a vision that I am not capable of giving you. But I hope in part I've started some seeds. I've planted some seeds with your hearts tonight on this vital issue. I hope that this weekend has planted seeds within your heart to stir your hearts to seek the kingdom of God. To stir your hearts to see greater possibilities that there are things that can be done to help our nation. Maybe it's not help our nation, but let's help ourselves. Maybe right now all we need is to help ourselves, to build ourselves up and go from there. I don't know, but I know Jesus can do that. Do you believe that? I mean, we come together and we pray for all kinds of things for Jesus to do. Why can't we pray for this? In other words, do we love and care for our nation enough like the, our pilgrim and Puritan forefathers did? They laid and established out a foundation because they loved the future. They loved their children. They wanted to help their children and they wanted to build 